hearing people's podcasts. I was like, this is a really cool outlet that I could use so that I can keep practicing and working on my education and making sure that I'm communicating well and also be able to share this with more people and have more than 30 seconds to a minute to talk to them about <laughs> these issues. Mm. So it just it, it, it really seemed to bring together a lot of things that I wanted to do. I wanted to communicate with people in a way that was meaningful and thoughtful. Greetings, fellow explorers, and welcome to the 23rd episode of Geekosopy 101, the podcast that explores the nexus between science, story, wonder, and philosophy. We've been your host, Dr. Yanis Kisten, and today we're exploring the wonders of wildlife conservation and education with Kristen of the Nagging Naturalist podcast. All right, welcome to the show, Kristen. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's been a quiet-ish weekend for me, thankfully, despite it being spring break. For us here in the States, um, which means that there's a lot of students not in Zoom school right now running around, mm, uh, mm. but it's been kind of quiet, so I like it. <laughs> so hopefully they're not like vacating and congregating in, in places and super spreading. I heard there was some bad stuff about that. Yeah, down south is pretty bad sometimes. Here in Maryland, it's been okay-ish. Mm. It's one of those things where we do better than a lot of states. But some people get so high and mighty about how well we do it that they don't realize when they're not doing it well. Like when I walk through the park and everybody's got like their mask beneath their nose and I'm just like, you're not doing it right. Like kudos for wearing the mask <laughs> still, but you, you're still not quite doing it right. It's just like it's props for props are due, but we, we could still do a little bit better. Thankfully, our vaccination rollout has been going pretty well. So we're, we're, we're doing okay. <laughs> mm, mm, that's pretty cool. Surviving. We, we're still waiting to move from phase one to phase two, with phase one being like first responders and, and medical uh, people. And yeah, hopefully we'll be vaccinated soon. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen very fast, but we don't seem to be going to get back to normal anytime soon. It's still going to be weird. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm very fortunate that because I'm in animal care and because, because, you know, animals require care all year round. Like people mm. sometimes ask me what my holiday plans are. And it's like, I, in the holidays, I still go in and have to take care of animals just because everybody else is on holiday. doesn't mean the animals and like zoos, aquariums, nature centers and stuff like that can't, can't be taken care of. We still have to go in and take care of them. So, you know, because uh, that's considered essential work, I was fortunate enough to be able to get my mm. vaccine early in one of the earlier phases of our rollout because I have to be in those spaces with other human beings. And especially since where I volunteer at is an attraction as well, which means lots of people mm. come through. Definitely had to get a vaccine. <laughs> it for was, sure. Yeah. Oh, man. That's good. That's good that they affected you guys in for the first rollout. We, like, I also work at a university. Um, and I also kind of, yeah, I keep animals for multiple days, so I do have to spend time on there. I can't do the whole work from home every day, but we we did not get affected into phase one, which sucked. Uh, so oh, we're still boo. waiting. <laughs> no. but, but anyway, speaking about uh, volunteering and keeping animals and stuff, so Kristen, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself uh, in this and who you are in this moment and what you do? Oh boy, in this moment, I am currently a college student I and a volunteer, as I mentioned. I am attending uh, one of the universities of Maryland. There's like a dozen of them. <laughs> I'm currently doing the online university uh, to get my degree in environmental management. I'm actually in the middle of my spring semester right now, and I've actually had to scale back a lot of my volunteering partly due to the pandemic and also partly due to uh, making sure that I'm keeping up with my classes. Mm -hmm. As far as the volunteering goes, I volunteer weekly in the animal programs department at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. And I will also be participating in some of the events coming up for our aquarium conservation team uh, in Baltimore, which we do cleanups and things like that uh, of areas that are trying to be restored. And I'm hoping that once I get my second vaccine and I'm all cleared to go, I can return to my other volunteering, which was doing horticulture in our Australia exhibit at the National Aquarium and also working in our animal care and rescue center, which is in a separate building, but still part of the National Aquarium. So 
uh, a big umbrella of national <laughs> aquarium stuff, but I'm currently only yeah, in two yeah. of my four departments right now. Jeez, it sounds like a lot of spinning plates in the air. Um, how did you start off um, volunteering at these places and start off with wildlife conservation and things like that? Well, I I would do uh, periodic volunteering when I was younger, but I think the first time I really decided to volunteer at a place was when I was living in Southern Maryland. I picked up some volunteering with some local organizations and I really enjoyed that. But because I don't drive, it they were really inaccessible and difficult sometimes if I didn't have somebody to get me somewhere. So it was, I eventually had to scale that back, but I really missed it. And so when my partner had to go to California to get training done for his job, I moved there with him for about a year. And while we were there, I wasn't working and I was afraid to work because I would only be there for a year. And so he was like, hey, there's a local volunteer opportunity at this aquarium. And at that time, I didn't know anything about the Monterey Bay Aquarium when we first were moving out there. I absolutely nothing. <laughs> now I realize that it's like the aquarium of like social media and all this stuff. And everybody yeah. who mm. does social media stuff knows, knows the Monterey Bay Aquarium. But I had no idea what their reputation was when I first moved out there. So he pointed me to that. So I was like, sure, why not? I mean, ocean animals are cool. I like animals. Sure. Mm. <laughs> at, at, at this point, moving out there, I was actually a two-time college dropout. I had started out doing journalism, and then I had shifted a little bit away from the journalism and leaned more into photography because I had done photography as a minor to do photojournalism. And that fell through. I just... I. I I had so much going on in my life and it was, you know, college is expensive when you're paying out of pocket in the States. Mm. So <laughs> I didn't want to go into debt. So I eventually dropped out twice. And so when we moved out there, I, I was, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was like, I don't have a college degree and I, I can't work and I don't know what I want to do. And so I joined the Monterey Bay Aquarium and it just, it clicked, it clicked so hard I met some of the most amazing people while I was there. My mentors, the staff, the other volunteers and stuff. I mean, all these really incredible people who uh, were very into wildlife and wildlife conservation. And it, it it just clicked in my head. I was like, this is what I want to do. <laughs> I want to teach people about wildlife because I, I enjoyed it so much there. And they had just started changing their program. Uh, uh, something had started in the States called NOKI, the National Network of Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. Um, mm. And, and NOKI fo focuses on, a it's a mixture of science-based, but also kind of social-based education. And what they did was they went out and they did specific polling. They tested things like values that people would click with. And they very carefully constructed a formula for how to create short, quick, but very engaging messages with people so that we could message more efficiently in places where, you know, here on a podcast, you might have a person for half an hour to an hour listening to you. So you have a ton of communicative real estate. When you're in zoos, aquariums, parks, museums, nature centers, whatever, you might have 30 seconds to a minute before somebody wants to move on to the next thing. You don't have hmm. a lot of uh, time real estate to give a message. And so, you know, they were giving us all these tools. I was learning all these new things and it just, it blew me out of the water how uh, intricate and careful and thoughtful and, and provocative some of this stuff was. And I was like, this is what, this is the community I want to be part of. These people are amazing. What they're doing is amazing. I, it just all clicked together and it, it didn't hurt that California is <laughs> an absolutely stunning place to live. Mm -hmm. You know, I lived in a place where in one direction I had the ocean and another direction I had the mountains. And then in any direction, north or south of me, there were brushlands, giant redwood forests, uh, beautiful rivers and lakes and parks. And just, I mean, I couldn't go anywhere and not find an absolutely stunning habitat to explore with all kinds of wildlife. So, I mean, it was, it was everything. And so uh, when we left California and we came to Baltimore, where I am currently, you know, I, I'm literally, well, no longer. I guess I'm more of a stone throw. <laughs> when I first moved to Baltimore, <laughs> I was just a stone throw from the aquarium. I could walk, walk 10 minutes to work uh, at the aquarium. And I also did work at Maryland Zoo as well for a little while. 
we moved a little bit further away, but still I can ride my bike to the aquarium in 10 minutes. And I also live next to the second largest park in Baltimore now too, which gives me access to a lot more urban wildlife so that when I mm. talk to people about Baltimore, which doesn't actually have a reputation for its wildlife, it's a lot of fun to, to, to talk to people about the access that they have to nature here, which I think surprises a lot of people, whether it's going over to the water and seeing jellyfish, blue crabs, uh, osprey and other animals, or whether it's coming to my local park and, you know, we have snapping turtles and, you know, all kinds of birds. There's snakes here. There's one single, single box turtle in the park. I mean, <laughs> it just, there's... There's so much that people miss and it's really exciting for me to be able to help connect people with nature because I think most people have a desire to connect with nature. Some people more in depth than others. Some just want to be able to admire a really pretty tree or see a really cool animal and then go about their business. And some people want to really immerse themselves in nature. And regardless of where a person stands on that scale, I like to be able to help connect them and make nature a more enjoyable place for them to be so that when people ask them to do things to preserve nature, they having any kind of connection will help make that something they're more positive and receptive towards. So, you know, I, I, I feel like for me, as much as I wanted to do journalism, I think part of the reason why I wanted to do journalism was to educate people and to help them be more informed so that they, they can make better decisions and, you know, follow that that moral compass to, to help them do good in the world. And, <laughs> you know, I grew up watching the news and I was like, you know what? I don't want to be like these people. <laughs> <laughs> and so wildlife conservation and education really kind of helped fill that niche for me where I can still help bring information and inform people about things so that they can try to make better decisions. And I also like it because it's a very holistic thing too. It really encompasses a lot. It's not just wildlife. And so that really helps as well is that it's not a one dimensional issue. It's a multi-dimensional issue and it brings with it a lot of inclusiveness and um, a more holistic view than I think some people are prepared for as well, which Baltimore in my mind is one of the most perfect places for this because we have such a diverse city with so many backgrounds. It's a very old city too. It's got a lot of history in it. And so there's a lot of discussions that happen in Baltimore. And I think people are surprised at how often some of these discussions intersect with conservation because they're thinking, oh, this is an issue because of this. And this is an issue because of this. It's like, no, this is all very intersectional. All of these things can be brought together under one umbrella and they have a lot of similar resolutions where if you do this one thing to help this one group or this one issue this cascades down into other areas of the city and culture and social justice and things like that it's just i love it i love being you know active and engaged in the community on this level where it's not just hey look at this bird you should help this bird out it's like here are ways that you can help this bird by doing these things here in the city and it's, it's, it's been a really cool learning and growing experience for me. And it all started with just my partner going, Hey, there's this one aquarium over here and where we are in California. You want to go check it out? You can do something there while I do my training. Could be fun. <laughs> Changed my whole life. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really cool. It seems like you really enjoy, um, kind of in-person, um, communication with people. And, but you also have tried to take your, your science communication and, and conservation education online with a, with a podcast. So why don't you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so the podcast idea, it, it, it was kind of an accumulation of things that had happened. I used to work a paid job at the National Aquarium where I did uh, education on the floor and I engaged people. And when I started to go back to school because... You know, unfortunately, no matter how much experience I have doing these things, uh, everybody wants that nice, pretty expensive piece of paper to go along with it. So I was mm -hmm. like, I really need to go back to school mm -hmm. and get this really expensive piece of paper that everybody wants me to get. And so when I did that, I, I decided to give up the job I had, the paid job I had, because it was not as flexible as my volunteer work. And so I've kept the volunteer work quit the job. And I was like, this is very frustrating because I've I've lost a lot of my communicative ability because that was a lot of where my communication was coming from was mm. uh, anywhere from one to four days a week 
uh, sometimes upwards of six, I was talking to people on the floor at the National Aquarium about conservation. And while I can kind of do that with some of the volunteer work I do, it wasn't to the same degree. <laughs> and also, people don't always trust volunteers as much as they do staff. And don't get me wrong, I mean, it's not it's not wrong, but it's also not right either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I really, I, I, I was like, I really need to find another outlet for talking about these things. And so I, I, I started listening to podcasts because I had restarted a podcast with a friend of mine. We had had this, well, he had started this podcast years and years ago, back when, when Avatar The Last Airbender, the original series was uh, airing on Nickelodeon. Uh, I helped run a forum about the show. And then uh, one of the people on the forum began his own podcast about the show. And he wanted to revisit the podcast after Legend of Korra had wrapped up and there were discussions of some other avatar projects coming out he's like hey i want to bring this podcast back do you want to join me and i was like sure why not <laughs> i'll do i'll do a podcast and i was doing the podcast for months and i was like you know i just i just do this one podcast i should probably go listen to other podcasts <laughs> and so I, I finally sat down and started listening to podcasts and i was like mm -hmm. this is this is really cool this is a this is a it's a really neat format where you know, it, it really is what you make of it. You can mm. you can literally do anything to make a pot. It's just you recording yourself in audio. It doesn't. There's no specific format or anything that dictates how you need to do it or what. I mean, yeah, there are things you can do to make it better, make it more popular, make it. You know, I I'm still learning the ropes of it a bit. I've been doing it for a year, but the problem is, is like I still do so much other work with volunteering in school that I just do the basics. I have my little intro, my little outro. I do a whole bunch of talking and then boom, done. <laughs> I don't do like <laughs> the fun transitions or anything cool. Like some yeah. people do yet. I, I want to, I want to eventually, mm -hmm. but it just, it, I realized like he, he, hearing people's podcasts, I was like, this is a really cool outlet that I could use so that I can keep practicing and working on my education and making sure that I'm communicating well and also be able to share this with more people and have more than 30 seconds to a minute to talk to them about <laughs> these issues. Yeah. So it, just, it, it, it really seemed to bring together a lot of things that I wanted to do. I wanted to communicate with people in a way that was meaningful and thoughtful. I wanted to make sure that I could communicate on my terms, um, which was really important to me. And so it was just, you know, after listening to like 30 different podcasts, I think at this point, I was just like, I guess I'll give it a shot. See how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I made my podcast, uh, the nagging naturalist. So yeah. And I'm, I'm still working on it. I'm, I'm hoping to eventually like do more with it. I, I'm not sure if I want to take it up to the professional level that some people do. Some people are able to do this basically as a job with like all their sponsors and stuff. Um, I really like in-person interactions though. So as cool as the podcast is for me, it really doesn't supplement that face-to-face -face interaction with mm -hmm. people. And the only other thing I don't like about a podcast is there isn't immediate engagement. I have to wait for people to ask questions and approach me about things that I've said. And even still, um, I, I, I really like the idea of, of you know, face-to-face -face interactions, getting immediate questions, answering them immediately uh, when people are thinking of it versus people listening to the whole podcast and going, oh, what was that question I had? I don't remember. Oh, never mind. I guess it wasn't that important. Just like, it's like, no, no, <laughs> just ask me a question. I, you know, I wish, I wish I could almost do it like, um, like the old school radio talk shows where I could have a caller call in. Like yeah. I, I say my spiel for like one section and then let people like call in and ask me questions in the middle of my recording or something like I, that would actually probably be a better format for me, but I'm, I'm not a radio star, so that's not going to happen probably. <laughs> but, um, I'm but sure yeah, over, time, over time you might be able to plug these things in. I mean, yeah, like having a podcast or any type of content creation on the internet is always a, a journey where you, kind of add things slowly over time um, so yeah I mean don't don't count yourself out I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out <laughs> as, as it goes uh, <laughs> I, I, I call in like con conservation so it actually sounds interesting so I wouldn't I wouldn't kill that idea too quickly I'd, I'd listen yeah I need to be more live streams <laughs> <laughs> 
So on, on your show, you basically talk about certain animals, right? Uh, how's, how, does, how does the format of your show work now? So I'm currently experimenting with trying to focus on habitats. And in focusing on habitats, I'm hoping to kind of help link the animals and show more relationships, especially when they share certain adaptations. Like the first one I did uh, for this year focused in Australia. Nope, nope, that was, I take that back. The second one I did this year focused on Australia back in February. And it was on the Esperance Mallee, which is a dry scrubland. And, you know, I did my first episode, but then as I did the consecutive episodes, there were like repeat adaptations that were coming up because they're, they're relevant adaptations for animals that live in dry scrublands. And I feel, I was hoping that by kind of focusing that, because, you know, I don't mind most podcasts they tend to jump around a bit they might focus on random animals you know there's not necessarily a lot of rhyme or reason they'll let like their their listeners choose animals and stuff like that like that's perfectly fine i just thought you know i don't i'm not trying to be the same as everybody else i don't want somebody to be like why would i listen to this i already listen to this podcast they do the exact same thing i try to find specific things that don't get covered in a lot of the other naturalist podcasts that just look at general animal adaptations. I want to focus more on looking at relationships with animals, looking at why they might have certain adaptations and focusing on the values they have, not just for their ecosystems, but also the way that they impact humans so that I can also build a bridge between uh, their adaptations in their lives and how that impacts us, whether it's on an economic or social level. Uh, One of my favorite examples was I did, well, I didn't end up doing the episode because I was having a really rough time with COVID, uh, but I had wanted to cover um, a lizard and this lizard had some really cool uh, mythology behind it for the indigenous people of Australia. And that's always really fun for me because sometimes animals in our social lives are things like, oh, this was on a TV show that one time. That's cool. (laughs) Like, I get it. That's a cool connection. But I really, I, I, I'm a mythology nerd. I love the different mythologies, creation myths, and relationships that people originally built with the native species. I feel like there is a much more deeper connection there. And I think people feel that. I think that's why a lot of people um, have kind of the reactions they do in both positive and negative senses to um, indigenous mythologies from around the world when we look at things, whether it's, you know, Asian, African, Australian, European, North or South American, you know, when we learn about really cool myths and the way that people viewed the world based on their culture and also based on their relationship with nature, it, it really paints a fascinating picture of how humans find connectedness in nature. And I really like tapping into that more than I do something like, oh, this is cool. This animal was on Finding Nemo. Like, I, I know that people have a positive experience with that, but I think that the, that some people feel a much more deeper connection when they think of an animal in the sense of something spiritual or mythological. I mean, think about how many people get tattoos or art designs and things like that that focus on Hmm. uh, these more, hate the word primitive because it's a terrible word, but, you know, the more ancient art forms and things like that that people did to show that connectedness. I think that that resonates with some people on a certain level because we understand that these people had a completely, they lived in a completely different world. They had a completely uh, different relationship to nature than most of us do nowadays. Some people still manage to maintain that relationship, but most of us don't. Hmm. No matter how hard we try to immerse ourselves in nature, we didn't even grow up even remotely close with to the relationship of nature that ancient peoples did. And so looking at how nature shaped some of our original co- cultures you know, I think that there's a depth to that that still resonate still resonates with modern modern people, which is why we see a lot of people getting more back into like their roots and things like that. I think that part of that also comes with uh, people's desire to connect with nature. Often, also comes with a desire to reconnect with uh, cultural backgrounds as well. 
And I find that fascinating that as people really try to delve more into their cultural and social identities, that sometimes nature gets brought more to the forefront because it's unavoidable. <laughs> like if you lived a thousand years ago or more, nature was an unavoidable part of your life. Even if you lived behind the walls of a city, you know, people had so much less control over things like, you know, uh, keeping pests out, keeping birds out and things like that. Nowadays, we have a lot more control over how we engage nature in a lot of our lives, especially in urban spaces, that people can essentially sterilize themselves of a lot of interactions with nature. And so it's, I'm rambling now, but <laughs> it, it I, I really wanted to bring that aspect out because I feel like that gets neglected a lot. Some people will bring up pop culture, which again, I mean, it's fine. It's fun. I get why we bring it up because some people that is their only engagement when they see something like, mm. oh, yeah, I saw that deep sea squid on my kid's show. They were watching like the Octonauts that one time and it brought up that cool deep sea squid. Yeah, that's where I've seen that. I don't want that to be, be as close as people try to get to some of these things. It is more interesting when people can find that much more intimate relationship that people back then had with animals. And so I really like to kind of tap into that much more um i'm trying to find the right word because i hate tribalistic i hate primitive i hate <laughs> a lot of the words that westerners use to describe these mm. things because they Spiritual have so many maybe. negative connotations <laughs> yeah it, it really is but it, it i wish we had better words that kind of uh connected to that time and place and those kinds of peoples better because it ancient is so broad like technically yeah. ancient isn't even that old. If I call something ancient, like I know we say ancient Egypt, but most things that we call ancient are like like 1200 years old. You know, when I talk mm. about ancient things, I'm talking like five to 12,000 years old. <laughs> you go really far back. Yeah. So I just, I need to get better vocabulary for describing th these things. But yeah, just, you know, I, I don't like to romanticize those time periods necessarily because of course, there's a lot of good things about the modern world and people, you know, not dying at early ages of diseases or infections from a simple cut. You know, I never try to romanticize things. I try to keep it in balance where it's like there's there's a place for this to, in our lives. There's a place for us to tap into old cultural identities and kind of tap back into that more spiritual and and connectedness with nature that people had without necessarily um falling for some of the inherent traps that come with romanticizing ancient cultures like mm. misrepresenting them in <laughs> our diets and our clothings and how we act and how we treat modern medicines <laughs> You know, I, I, it's one of those things where there's definitely a good balance that we can find as educators where we can discuss these things and talk about how admirable and desirable certain aspects of ancient cultures are without necessarily getting into the very hairy situations we find ourselves in with people who are like, oh yeah, our modern lives are full of chemicals and poisons and we're just... <laughs> And we're just killing ourselves with this modern lifestyle. And it's like, no, no, that wasn't what I was trying to say. Because <laughs> I have gotten into those conversations unintentionally where it's like, I've been trying to talk about, you know, having that connectedness with, and somebody literally just spun it into this completely different discussion where I was like, that wasn't what I was trying to talk to you about at all. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the thing because it's so interconnected. You could just go off on a tangent and, and tangent and end off somewhere you don't really want to be in. But for, from what from what I kind of understand, it's it's just different levels of like storytelling. Like of course, like many centuries ago, more of the stories people would be telling each other would be about the natural environment because they were in it. And as we kind of try to cut ourselves off from nature, you know, the stories changed. And that's why you only get, you know, a story about, um, I don't know, like a clownfish from Finding Nemo. Because you, you, like, before, like, if you were a coastal community, you would try to, to, to dive for, and spearfish and stuff for that, stuff like that. And then you would see it and then you would go back and tell, um, your, I suppose, your, your tribe. 
uh, or your your community, and then those kind of stories would would you know then kind of inform everybody around there. But because we are, I suppose, so st- live so sterilely and so uh, apart from our environment now, those stories have diminished, and that's why the only kind of perspective we have is stuff that you watch in movies or, or documentaries, and and so I see where your frustration comes from, um, and I suppose that's probably why, like communicating at a at a zoo or a park or something like that is is helpful. Um, and I suppose one of the big, I suppose, problems we need to solve is getting people there so that they can be exposed in a different way, in a different mode um, than, you know, that is, I suppose, the, the normal way these days, which is, which is kind of weird. So, yeah, it, it always, to me, like science communication um, and education always comes down to like storytelling because, like, I mean, I've had a few guests on the show um in different modes whether it's you know podcasting or making youtube videos or even like cosplaying um or dressing up um it it always comes back to the either the type of story they want to tell or using an existing story to kind of bridge the gap to try and try and help teach um so yeah, it, it kind of comes down to what mode of, of story you want to tell and how you want to hook people, what you like doing, what you're comfortable with, I suppose, in my uh, humble opinion, when it comes to teaching. Do you have any thoughts about storytelling and what you do? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, like you said, I mean, storytelling, I think that that's kind of at the heart of SciComm is, and this discussion kind of came up recently too, is that being a scientist doesn't inherently make you a science communicator just because you post about your research or something. Science communication is about making it accessible and understandable to people who aren't experts in these fields, who don't have these backgrounds. So, you know, it's not simply saying, hey, here's what I researched, here's information, here's some links, because people might go and read those things and may have no clue, it's not on their level. Mm -hmm. So the first thing comes down to who's your audience? You know, how I'm going to talk to a first grader about animal adaptations is going to be completely different about how I talk to a high schooler or an adult who I expect to have, you know, typically a high schooler's understanding at least or higher of, you know, science. Although modern interpretations aren't always, (laughs) I've definitely seen Mm -hmm. some conversations with adults where I don't feel like they picked up their science books in high school, (laughs) (laughs) but you know, but at the end of the day, just general storytelling is a lot of what SciComm is. It really is because that's really what people often remember. I mean, people, I mean, who can recite anything from their textbooks growing up versus who can quote storylines from their favorite Disney movie? <laughs> you know, and I, I understand to a certain degree, we can't tell all stories in Disney format. Not everybody wants no. to tell stories <laughs> in Disney format. No, who but, can? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but that is what resonates with people. So that's why things like, as much as I hate to admit it, that's why people remember so much about Finding Nemo, even though Finding Nemo is so inaccurate from so many standpoints, (laughs) people remember it. And it would be nice if Disney had done more. Well, I guess Pixar, Disney, whatever they are, had done more to be more scientifically accurate if they didn't like how certain adaptations went maybe they shouldn't have used a freaking clownfish as their main (laughs) character they didn't like those adaptations but absolutely storytelling is really at the heart of it and making it something that that is memorable that's a big thing is memorable if something isn't memorable people aren't going to take it anywhere with them it's not going to lead to any kind of meaningful or thoughtful action or behavior changes for the better if it doesn't resonate with them so finding connections with people and this is what's also nice about connect about talking to people on an individual level versus like um a big broad platform is when you have that individual engagement at like zoos aquariums museums and such is you can kind of ask some probing questions and get an idea for what motivates people because that was part uh, that was a big part of Noki was you know ask open ended questions where they can't just say yes or no get them to talk a little bit and kind of explore who they are and once you get kind of a, a picture of who they are in your head then you can take a value 
that's relevant to them and apply it to the message. So the most common and popular value was protection. All people can relate to protection, the need to protect people you care about, the need to protect your property, the need to protect your reputation. Like there's any number of ways that people protect things. And so taking that context and applying it to animals is pretty easy and pretty relatable for people of so many different backgrounds because it's a very universal um, value for people. Uh, one of the second most popular ones though was responsible management. Now here in the US, that made sense to me, especially when we're talking about older generations, um, especially like that boomer and some of the older Gen X generations here in the States. Responsible management kind of falls a little bit into that same category as people who talk about things like fiscal responsibility and things like that. So these people who really feel like there needs to be accountability and people need to be responsible in their actions, you know? So when I talk to somebody who maybe doesn't care about protecting the environment for the sake of protecting the environment, like for me, that's my motivation. If you tell me that this native species and this environment's declining, you don't need to give me a reason why I need to protect it. I will want to protect it because it's nature. And that's, that's my, that's an instinct for me. Some people don't have that same motivation though. And mm. we kind of have to accept that. And if we want everybody on board in conservation, we have to be able to tap into everybody from different backgrounds and different moral motivations basically and some people are more concerned about human economy and human well-being over wildlife and nature do i agree with it not really but i still need those people on board because you know they're voters they're people who can take civic action and if they're on the same page as me it doesn't matter what differences we have if the outcome is still that conservation is successful then I'm gonna use a different value for them. And responsible man management really seems to resonate with people who are on that spectrum more of having economic motivations and things like that for why they might wanna protect something. So if I say uh, this native fish is a very popular sports fish and it people who uh, pay to travel out, rent or buy gear and pay for permits in states where they can go and catch these fish, um, brings in, you know, X amount of hundred million dollars every year for local economies, that might be a stronger driving point than saying this fish is essential to the river stream and ecology and other animals will suffer and decline if this fish also declines because hmm. the rivers won't be as healthy. You know, those are two completely separate messages, but the end goal is still protecting that species of fish. So it doesn't matter that I have to use a different value and different message as long as it's resonating with the person I'm talking to. So, you know, that's kind of a big, big point of the storytelling is figuring out my audience and then very carefully constructing a story where I, uh, the, the formula for Noki is a little simple. You introduce what you're talking about, basically. Um, and if possible, you might tap into a specific adaptation or behavior they have that is relevant to either its decline or how we can protect it. Uh, after you introduce the species, you'll talk about the issue and then you present people with a solution. That's always the key is you don't just go, here's the problem we need to solve it. Cause then mm. people might feel hopeless. If it sounds like a really big problem, they're mm. like, what, what am I supposed to do about this? This is massive. And to be fair to a certain degree, there are some issues that people can't solve as individuals. And you might have to tap into things like civic action, like make sure you're voting, make sure you're uh, telling your local representatives about this issue and that you disagree or agree with certain things that are coming mm. up. But you know, for the most part, a lot of it does focus on individual action in a lot of cases. And it might be something as simple as, you know, uh, a really big one for me locally is it's springtime right now. And a really big issue we have in the springtime is, of course, a lot of baby animals uh, get rescued when they shouldn't be touched. <laughs> so we tell people like, you know, before you go and you pick up that abandoned fawn or what you think is an abandoned fawn or what you think is abandoned baby bunnies or something like that. Here's a checklist for you to go through and make sure that before you ever touch these animals, these are the things that you're considering first, because you might actually be <laughs> quote unquote, what most biologists say is kidnapping <laughs> uh, these animals. Uh, even if it's not intentional, you are technically kidnapping them because they're perfectly fine. Their mothers will take care of them and you're actually interfering with a natural cycle and behaviors. So it's 
I actually kind of enjoy the challenge. Like uh, it's, it's not, it's not always perfect. I don't always do it right. Sometimes I, I look at something I did or said and come back later and go, you know what? I could have, I could have phrased this differently. I could have done, I could have used a different word here, or I could have shifted the focus a little differently. So it's, it's fun because it's also a bit of a learning process for me coming up with the right strategies for storytelling to make sure that, you know, if I, if my audience is super broad, like it is on my podcast and I can't know how everybody who listens feels, I can carefully construct a broad message. But if I know that I'm focusing on something in particular or a particular group of people, um, if my mess, like in, in the case of the baby animals, my messaging is directed at a certain group of people. People who listen to my podcast may not always fall within that group, but a lot of my messaging was specifically for <laughs> people who try to rescue baby animals that don't need rescuing in a lot of cases. Cause that is a really huge problem in the U S is people trying to rescue baby animals because you know, it's natural. We see a baby animal. We don't see mom. We assume it's abandoned. Our empathy kicks in and we think we're doing something good by trying to help them. And instead we're impeding on a natural behavior, a natural process mm -hmm. of upbringing for these animals. And, you know, it's, it's like, I never wanted to discourage you from feeling empathy with wildlife. Your empathy for wildlife is a good thing, but it has to be tempered with knowledge <laughs> or else you could hmm. accidentally do something harmful because, you know, good intentions can have negative consequences. So it's, it's a fun challenge trying to do that because, you know, sometimes I find out when I learn from some of the people I interview, I listen and I'm like, you know what? I realize I've made those mistakes too. Hmm. Whoops. You know, it's, <laughs> Uh, I love it. I'm growing. I'm learning. I hope that people who listen are growing and learning. And I'm, I'm hoping that eventually I can fine tune my podcast and find this perfect equilibrium where I feel like I'm telling my stories the best way possible consistently for all people as much as possible and really reaching out very broadly. But ultimately, ultimately my goal is to get back to doing that on an individual level, because it, I do think it ends up being a little bit more meaningful and impactful when you have face-to-face interactions. I don't know what that's going to look like post COVID, <laughs> but I, I, I do hope to safely be able to do that again in the future. Mm, for sure. Um, well, the, the one thing that's nice about podcasts is that it's, you know, scalable, so you can potentially reach a lot more people, but I suppose your, the way you deliver your message would have to kind of kind of change the, the, does it ever go the other way around like after starting your your podcast and having this long form format does did it influence in any way your your in-person communications or, or vice versa i suppose it does in some ways i think the way that it, it's influenced the most isn't the way i expected it like i i i knew that learning how to podcast was going to be a growing experience where I would have to constantly figure things out and get better. Cause you know, I didn't, I didn't take a class for this. This isn't something I'm trained to do. I'm, I'm literally flying by the seat of my pants in a lot of cases. Um, and I'm very fortunate that a lot of people who have been doing podcasts have reached out to me and been like, Hey, you seem to be having an issue with this. Here's how you can fix that. Or here's something else you can be doing. And it's like, Oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for helping me. Cause I appreciate that. But um, last year when I did a series of takeovers where I let people come over and I, I invited some, uh, women to come onto my podcast and literally just make it what they wanted it to be. Sometimes it was wildlife based. Sometimes it wasn't. And I was fine with that. I knew there was a chance, especially considering a lot of the, uh, civic unrest that we had last year in the States during COVID, mm -hmm. uh, during all the protests that were happening, uh, with black lives matters and other things that were going on. I, I knew that, especially because all the all the women I invited were black, I knew that the conversation was going to have intersections outside of wildlife conservation. That was kind of the point, was very often when we talk about wildlife conservation, there isn't always as much intersection outside of wildlife as there should be. So I wanted to be able to help uh, show people how how those things intersect with each other and how we can be more holistic in our approaches to wildlife conservation, how it shouldn't just be about protecting wildlife. Sometimes when we fix other areas where we're having issues like social justice, sometimes that cascades into things like wildlife conservation and people don't make, some people don't put those things together. They don't, they're like, how is it that fixing like bad funding for schools in low income areas is going to help wildlife? 
Well, when schools do really well and they flourish and you have teachers who can do their jobs and do it right and schools that can take kids on things like field trips, you know, that changes a child's experiences and what they interact with. And I remember my high school wasn't a bad high school, but it wasn't a good one either. It was somewhere we were in the top 1000 high schools in the U.S. for all that means. <laughs> and we weren't even that high on that list. So it was it was like I, I did have the opportunity to go on some pretty cool field trips to some museums and things like that. And I know that those things had an impact on me and what I decided to do later in life. Like one of the reasons why I originally wanted to get into photojournalism was my photography teacher took us on a trip to see um, a temporary photography exhibit done for 9-11 the year after it happened. And that had a huge impact on me and how I felt about the medium of photography and how you could tell a story through a single picture. And, you know, that's kind of where the idea of storytelling came to me is like, this is something I want to do. This is how I want to communicate with people. So I want, I want people to see something I've done and be able to take a story away from that. That's going to be impactful to them. So, you know, that was big for me. And I did get to go to things like parks for school and I got to connect with nature in school. I know people that went to school and never took a field trip, never set foot in a park in an educational setting. The only time they visited parks was, you know, with family and it was strictly for recreation and they didn't make those strong connections. And so when they did it as an adult where they went out into nature specifically to engage in nature, they're like, wow, this is amazing. Why did I never do this? And it's like, imagine how that would have changed the path of their life if they had made that connection sooner, if they didn't have to wait until their 20s or 30s mm. to make these connections. And something as simple as taking care of your low-income areas and making sure that people's most basic needs are being met because a person who is, you know, struggling to pay their bills, struggling to get groceries in their house, struggling with medical issues that they can't treat, they, they don't have the luxury very often of just going out and enjoying nature. Hmm. Even if the nature is close and accessible, they've got other priorities. And even when they're out in nature, sometimes they're so busy in the back of their head thinking of all the things they have to take care of. They don't have time to just relax and unwind. And something as simple as taking care of people and making sure that people feel, hmm. you know, safe and depression and all these other issues that my generation and newer generations are struggling with can open them up to other things like being able to conserve nature. And we see that here in Baltimore. Uh, I had one episode in November because I started to take a break in November, but I squeezed in one last episode because I've had the good fortune of working with uh, Simone Barkley, who she's an educator at the National Aquarium professionally. And she does a lot of outreach here in Baltimore. And she specifically tries to help connect kids in Baltimore with nature. And, you know, I had some people who were like, you know, I never really thought of the idea of Baltimore having like good parks or being a good place to be in nature. And I'm like, we have amazing parks here in Baltimore. I've seen some of the coolest animals like, um, Merlins are extremely rare here in Maryland. Um, they're the least, one of the most uncommon raptors we have in Maryland. They're, they can be extremely hard to find. Um, and I think when I, usually when I post them on in I'm Naturalist, it actually marks them as critically imperiled for Maryland. So very uncommon bird. I've gotten more pictures of Merlins in the city of Baltimore than I have in the entire United States, <laughs> traveling around to different states. Mm. Baltimore is a phenomenal place, but everybody focuses so much on all the issues that Baltimore has. They're always like, oh, Baltimore's got so much crime. There's so much civic unrest. You know, when I first moved here in 2015, we had riots and fires that broke out uh, in response to the Freddie Gray incident where he had been, he had died due to riding in a police vehicle. And so protests broke out. I literally moved in in the middle of that going on. I had just gotten into my apartment and literally a few blocks away from me, they said and set CVS on fire. Oh, and so geez. everybody's like, oh no. And I'm just like, well, you know, this is what happens when you don't take care of people. Like, hmm. how am I supposed to tell these people that they need to protect the animals over here in this park when they're busy trying to stay alive in hmm. their own city? Like, I can't, hmm. I can't do that. I can't. And so that's, the biggest thing that I've really been learning and growing with is I was already coming into it a little bit more mind, like social justice minded with it, but I wasn't quite sure 
how it was going to be brought into my podcast. And I would still like to add more of that to my podcast, more intersectionality. But that was a huge thing that I grew with last year with my podcast. Um, when I had first started, it was when I had those September takeovers and listening to these women's stories um, about how they grew into who they are, how they reached these points, some of the trials and tribulations they went through. And actually I did have one guy because when Chelsea Connor did her takeover, she invited her friend Carl, um, who is a black man who actually worked not too far from me. He actually did uh, some work out of the National Zoo in DC. And we keep talking about him coming back up and us hanging out. He's supposed to show me all his cool animals at the DC Zoo and he's supposed to come to Baltimore and let me show off all my cool animals here in Baltimore <laughs> at some point. Um, but but it, was, it was really great for me to get all these experiences, hear about them, and it really kind of helped me think a little bit more about how I want to integrate these things into my podcast and how I want to tap into these areas that are very often neglected because I... And I, I never want to sound like I'm criticizing other podcasts that do wildlife. I really don't because there's nothing wrong with them just talking about wildlife and, and discussing the, it the way they do. I just want to make sure that, you know, when I do mine, I really want to try to help bring in those voices that aren't necessarily being brought up in some of the other podcasts as much that aren't getting that kind of representation. Um, and I, I really need to, <laughs> This is where my antisocialness really works against me because I really need to tap more into the very large community that is available online and on social media because, you know, I haven't had um, somebody at least who self-identifies as indigenous on my podcast yet in any place. Um, you know, most of the people who have been on my podcast so far have been people that I know personally or have, you know, made friends with recently and in other cases, they've been people that I've connected with on places like Twitter, because Twitter is just a massive place to connect with all these amazing uh, wildlife experts and PhD researchers and stuff. But, you know, there, there's a really big hole in my podcast. It's, I mean, to be fair, it's still new. I'm only just now like a year old in my podcast. Um, but I do really want to start tapping more into... Um, like if I, if I talk about Australian animals, I would really like to talk to somebody who's indigenous to Australia and hear more about their perspectives on conservation where they live and their cultural perspectives and how that impacts the way they see nature. Same with if I talk about Asian animals, African animals, European animals, you know, North American, South American. Like when I go to all these places, I, I want to try to find more people who are from these places who have not just a connection with them because they study them, but also a cultural connection with them that really helps to kind of um, give that perspective that those of us who don't live there and don't have that connection lack. Like, I think it helps build more empathy. It makes it more memorable and it will hopefully help people to, you know, listen to other voices more because if we do look at a lot of people, especially in the States, who do wildlife education, uh, we're a little bit on the monochromatic side. And I know that I personally don't help that, but at the very least, I can try to find people who don't currently use my platform, people who aren't podcasting, but who do want to share their knowledge and uh, share their experiences to be able to help, you know, give them more of a platform and, and, and give them more voice uh, that's something that's become more and more important to me as I do this podcast because it was such a big uh, learning experience for me uh, last year, letting those black women take over my podcast. And I realized that, you know, that's definitely something that I think is lacking in a lot of the wildlife podcast community. And I think that it should be something that for those who uh, want to be more social justice minded, socially justice minded social justice minded i don't know how to say that <laughs> more mindful of social justice issues and want to try to do that you know that's a really easy simple thing to do is to try to network and reach out and and bring more of those voices onto their podcast i know that some people aren't formatted for it but for those of us that are that do have that more open format that people don't have 
like, I don't think anybody necessarily has big expectations for my podcast one, because I do change it so much. And two, because I have kind of experimented a bit with interviews and how I do interviews and takeovers. I think that because, uh, the expectations for my podcast still aren't solidified because I keep changing it. It gives me a little bit more room to adjust it. So I'm not necessarily bringing something unexpected on my listeners. When I do these things, I've established with them how I feel about these things. I've, I've said it out loud that I support things, uh, certain social justice movements like black lives matter and made that clear that that's something that is important to me and that that's something I want to work towards in my podcast. I just, I need to figure out a better way to do it. And I really need to just break out of my antisocial bubble and network more. That's that's probably my biggest shortcoming on the podcast. Um, like I said, you'll probably work it out as you go. It's yeah, a, a year is, is nothing. Well, my podcast is, is even younger than that. But the idea that everything is is connected and goes into you know, social justice uh, type of issues is is pretty interesting. And, you know, in, in the science, uh, I suppose more on the research side, we do have things like socioeconomics when it comes to, you know, wildlife conservation or, you know, fisheries or, or anything like that. And it's, it's relatively newer compared to, you know, just conservation or just, you know, fisheries. Um, the intersection between human beings and nature is a really important one to um, investigate because it's it's kind of more than the sum of its parts you know it's not just people in a bubble and it's not just uh, the natural world in a bubble the, the, the interaction between the two is really important to to investigate and if you if you just try and tie them you know, very singularly, then you miss out on things like, oh, how did, you know, a net, how did a indigenous uh, population interact with a um, natural population? How did that change, you know, after they were colonized or after they were modernized? And, and these things really impact how people now interact with the environment. Uh, because it's so different than the past, you know, and it even goes up to, you know, scientific um, investigation when you have, you know, these these first world scientists that come through and kind of um, steal up, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, uh, it might be a way oh, to... we discovered this animal. <laughs> let's ignore the people that have seen it for the, thousands of years. Yeah, we discovered yeah, it. Yeah, let's ignore the people yeah. that were living in yeah. and amongst them, you know. They might just get used as, as tour guides and, and that's it. But they have all of oh, this man. knowledge that's been passed on, like, for for generations um, and we call that parachute science and yeah a lot of people are not that happy about it these days especially in, in a place like South Africa that's you know was colonized we had apartheid and stuff like that and it totally kind of changed the landscape and many African countries where um, you know first of all scientists come through you know take take the science and kind of take it back to, to the first world and leave uh, either indigenous scientists or indigenous people without much um, you know help or even credit for that matter and, and it kind of sucks but i think it is getting better um over time we're I'm certainly sure. getting better about talking about it i yeah. mean the actions are still a little lacking but yeah i think <laughs> yeah. that i've definitely seen more of that conversation happening and i'm very grateful because there are definitely times where i would see things where, like you said, people will just dive on in. We're like, oh, we're going to go study this animal. And I think probably the most frustrating part of it for me is when scientists from Western countries go into an indigenous community, find an animal, find it's endangered, find that it's been a resource of indigenous people and inherently go, oh, these indigenous people are killing off this animal because of their unsustainable practices. And it's like, you know, this culture has existed for thousands of years uh, this animal's existed for millions of years, and yet, for some odd reason, it's only starting to go extinct in the last 50 to 100 years. Are you sure it was the indigenous <laughs> people's fault? Like, mm. it's it's one of those things where you can just, if you if people just sat down and thought about it for a few seconds, they could see the narrative is skewed. It's not that hard to see the biases in Western science and how they present their discoveries. And I... <laughs> I interact with a lot of people who study um, 
uh, Arabic culture and language due to, due to um, some of the people in my life who um, are part of that community. And so when I engage sometimes with other white people who don't know much about Arab culture, it can be so frustrating for me because, you know, they'll say things about, oh, well, you know, they don't, they don't really believe in science. And I'm just sitting here like, do you realize that the only reason why Europe had a renaissance was essentially because of the Islamic golden age that happened in the Middle East and North Africa? Like there were brilliant people who existed and who thought of things. I mean, evolution was discussed by Islamic scientists hundreds of years before Darwin. So it's one of those things where I, you know, I already in my personal life due to my exposure in my personal life to certain cultures before I even got into wildlife conservation, I already had like this idea that Western narratives are very much like the Victor gets the right history kind of vibes where, mm. you know, they're like, <laughs> yeah. these are our textbooks. So we're going to write our stories yeah. in them and not anybody else's. And it's like, to a certain extent, I understand it. Every culture is very centric when they tell their own stories about themselves. I, I acknowledge that every culture, no matter how innocuous they are, have their biases towards themselves. That's, that's inherent. But don't look at me <laughs> and talk to me about science and act like science can't have biases. It's that it's not that science can't. It's that it shouldn't. There's a difference. Science shouldn't have as many biases as it does. Mm. But it is riddled with them and it has been since it's in its inception and it gets so frustrating having some conversations with people because they do very much completely neglect people from certain regions i mean covid's been a nightmare because of all the people saying stuff about chinese culture which in and of itself is all already awful because some, China's massive. There are different people and cultures in China. It's it's frustrating when people get lumped together. It's frustrating when people generalize certain behaviors and attitudes like, oh, they're from China, so they must use rhino horn as an aphrodisiac. It's like, mm, no, <laughs> no, that's not how that works. That's not how any of this works. And it's just, it, it, yeah, that's, that's a huge point of contention for me. And I, it's tricky for me because... I, I constantly have to look at it and go, I am a white person. I am part of the same group who perpetuates a lot of these issues. It's important for me to speak out, but also careful to balance my voice to make sure I'm never speaking over anyone. Um, and that's that's a constant place of balance that I'm trying to work at too, is I never want to speak over anyone if possible. Like if somebody's already said something as well as or better than I could have ever said it, then sometimes it's just easier to quote them like, hey, this person said this, I 100% agree with this go check out their stuff. Um, sometimes people aren't talking about it and it's like, all right, I need to say something, but I need to be careful how I say this because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. There may be a reason why this hasn't been talked about yet. Um, it just, it's fun. It's, it's, <laughs> it's fun trying to, 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 to figure out, you know, when, am, when am I using my privilege for good? And when, am, when is it actually just privilege is, is a constant, uh, work balance I have to find with my podcast and in my personal life. Hmm. It's, it's, I suppose it's difficult to always be mindful and aware. Uh, I suppose that's why a lot of people aren't because it's, it's difficult to always keep these things in, in your mind and it's, it, it drains your energy, I suppose, um, in some way. And that's why it's so difficult to get ideas like, you know, conserving animals and stuff across, especially like you said, with people who just want to put food on the table and, and try and figure out where their next meal is, is coming from. So I, I commend you for <laughs> trying to keep all of these things in mind. It must be tiring. Um, no more tiring than it is for the people who have to deal with the other side of it, I'm yeah, sure. For sure, indeed. Um, so this is quite interesting because just naturally you've kind of answered a lot of the questions that I had for you with with a couple of questions <laughs> oh, I, that I did. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a rambler. I apologize about that. I no, ramble cool. a lot. I, I, was, I was riveted by your stories and, and I really... Um, Enjoyed your journey. It's it's quite an interesting one that you that you've taken. Um, so I think on the try to pick it up from the kind of darkish tones that we we went down there for a bit. Um, so from what you've learned 
you know, over the years, speaking personally with people and now starting uh, a podcast. What are some of the more obscure tips that you would give other people who try to do the type of things that you do in the conservation space? In the conservation space, I think that I really do think that one of the most important things that we can do is try to be more holistic. I think that some people put on blinders and it's not their fault. It comes from older generations and professional quote unquote expectations that they have of how people should act and how people should approach certain things. And the problem is, is that You know, of course, a lot of our ideas for professionalism and how we should approach certain things are very exclusive, which is why they don't really work in modern formats to make sure that uh, we're bringing in as many people as possible under the umbrella of conservation, because that should always be the goal. The goal of conservation is to get everybody on board. We're all hearing the same messages. We all understand them. We all know why they're important and we're all going to take actions that are going to help improve and, and make better the world as a whole, especially the natural world. You know, that, in my mind, is, is what we're doing with conservation. And I think the problem is, is people aren't necessarily always focused on making sure that their outreach is maximized to all the right people. I think sometimes people are more focused on being a popular voice rather than making sure that the people who are hearing them and understanding them are a broad audience. Because when you become a popular voice, (laughs) sometimes it might just mean that you're very popular among a very specific audience. And when your audience is very exclusive, if it's, you know, if you're only reaching a certain age group, a certain race, a certain sex or gender, uh, certain educational backgrounds, you know, and you're not reaching out as widely as you could be, then you're not progressing things uh, in conservation necessarily. All you're doing is catering to one specific group, which can be helpful, especially if it's a group that's often neglected. But in a lot of cases, from what I've seen, a lot of people have a lot of the same demographics of, you know, certain people in wild, like when I look at wildlife conservation podcasts and they talk about their stats on whatever platform they're part of, a lot of it's people in their 20s and 30s. It's mostly women. It's mostly white and some and black people, not necessarily a lot of other people like um, East Asians, Indians and other people like that. It, it's it. And especially too, it's also mostly people in the States and English speakers, which to a certain extent, like, I get it. Like, (laughs) I'm not multilingual. I can only reach out to so many people. I'm very fortunate Hmm. that a lot of people in foreign countries are typically bilingual or else um, I probably wouldn't have as many listeners as I do in other (laughs) countries. But still, like, you know, if, if we're not actively engaging as many communities as possible if we if we're not looking and seeing that we're reaching a very narrow demographic and not working to broaden those demographics then we're not really progressing the way we need to because i find that it would be more important if i reached older audiences because a lot of conservation issues that resonate with young people nowadays don't resonate with older audiences because they think that we're just the next generation of hippies um, and so a lot of them just are just kind of like, uh, you know, they'll grow up like, and, and that's, unfortunately, that's a thing in the U S is everybody believes that you, you're a liberal when you're young, but you're a conservative when you're older. That's like this whole thing that people actually believe. And in my mind, it's, that's not what, that's not what's important. I understand that in their mind, they think that we're just being, um, irresponsible and that as we get more responsible we'll get more conservative and therefore these things won't be as important it's that we realize that we can't have a good stable economy without healthy nature like literally human human civilization cannot exist or thrive even without a healthy environment we understand that it's not a matter of being liberal it's not a matter of being a hippie this is this is general knowledge and that message doesn't resonate well with older audiences. And there are a lot of people who are going to be able to vote for many more decades who are alive who don't believe that. And so for me, I would like to be able to reach out to older audiences. I would like to be able to resonate with younger audiences, even though my show is not necessarily geared towards kids. I do try to keep it relatively safe for work so that 
people can listen to it with a younger audience, you know, in the car or something. So I do want to try to to reach out and, and be more broad. And I think that a lot more people who do wildlife conservation should think of those things. You know, am I only resonating with one group of people? Now, if, if, if it's a target audience, I get it. Like if you work in fisheries and your target audience is people who eat seafood, who cares if vegans don't listen to you? They're not eating <laughs> seafood. Don't care. Mm. People with shellfish aller- allergies who can't eat seafood, that's fine if they're not part of your demographic. Cool. I get it if you have a target audience, but if you're in general wildlife conservation like me, your goal should constantly be about expanding your audience. It's not about being the most popular person. I do understand that to a certain extent, as you broaden an audience, you do become more popular. But you know, it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be so focused on on being popular that you fail to engage as many communities as possible. So I think that that is something that people can work towards. And the best way to do that is actually to bring other people from other communities in. So some people might like, I made this mistake initially when I just looked at the podcast as just me, like I was going to be the person talking, it was going to be me. So therefore I had to do all that work. But something as simple as inviting other people from communities that I don't belong to, people from Black communities uh, or people from other background, other educational backgrounds outside of mine, um, people from different countries than me, like bringing in people from these communities I didn't belong to suddenly helped broaden my engagement to people who didn't normally listen to my podcast and people who were outside of my typical demographics that listen to my podcast. It was that simple. So I think for wildlife conservationists who really want to be better at engaging people and make sure that they're they're educating as many people as possible, things as simple as inviting other people to, to engage with you and to help bring that representation into your podcast, blog, YouTube, whatever it is you do <laughs> in order to educate people bringing in that representation matters. And we know that now more than ever. Um, We're starting to see a lot more of that with the advent of social media and being able to see people's reactions, seeing children and young adults, seeing people who look like them saying and doing things that they didn't think they could do is meaningful. And I actually, I, I specifically discussed some of this with Simone Barkley too. The idea of people seeing themselves in these fields is really meaningful. So, you know, it can still be your stuff. It's not like you necessarily have to erase yourself. You just need to invite more people in to have these conversations with you so that people can see and hear from somebody that they relate to, because I'm never going to be a person of color. I'm never going to be um, non-binary. I'm never going to be a lot of things. There's, I can only be me. And so it's going to help me help others resonate with my message when I can help bring in people from their community who go, yeah, this is what we do. This is what we, this is what we need people to do. These are the things you need to know. It's, it's a huge thing. And I think that networking is a big thing that everybody can really do to help bring more people under this umbrella. Cause that's, I think that's really the big goal we should be focusing on is some, Sometimes we focus so much on get the message out and then get to the solution in a hurry. But if you get to the solution, but only some people got to the solution with you and we left all these other people behind, that's not conservation. That's Hmm. only conservation for some people. And unfortunately, it's usually very privileged people who benefit from conservation and it leaves people who are less privileged behind. And we're seeing a lot of that now. We see so many communities of less privileged people who are suffering because conservation is done in areas where people of privilege live, um, people with higher incomes, white people, uh, Christian communities and things like that in the States, while other communities are completely left behind and they have respiratory issues because of poor air quality or there's lead in their system because of uh, bad water infrastructure and things like that. So before we rush to get to the solutions of conservation, we have to make sure that the whole group's with us. You know, you don't get on the school bus to take the kids back to school and leave like 18 of your 23 kids behind. (laughs) You have to make sure everybody's on the bus before you go. And Mm. that's the thing is I'm, I'm currently trying to pack my bus as much as possible. And that's what every conservationist should be doing is trying to pack the bus with as many people so that as we head out and get to the places where we need to be, um, 
we're taking as many people as possible so that, you know, we're helping more people, we're being more impactful and more importantly, everybody's on the same page. Cause that, I think that's the other side of conservation is not everybody has the same solutions for everything. And, you know, in some cases, different solutions are valid. And in other cases, some solutions aren't valid. Um, a really big example of this is, is recycling. Um, while recycling as an idea isn't inherently bad, recycling as a solution is a problem because recycling is a band-aid. It's not a solution. Recycling doesn't fix anything. Recycling just very often just puts off the inevitable. Uh, one of my favorite examples that I heard in college was, you know, if you take water bottles and turn them into a plastic bench in a park, they're still eventually going to be garbage. It's just going to take them longer to get to the landfill. But the landfill is still ultimately the destination. They're still plastic and they're still a problem. You didn't change anything about that solution. Reducing is, you know, it, it, it's that thing where it's like recycle, reduce, reuse. Reducing is always supposed to be the first one. Reusing the second. Recycling is supposed to be your last ditch effort if you just have to make something bad. <laughs> <laughs> Even reusables aren't that great because in a lot of cases, most reusables are plastic. Um, and I, I get why I'm not, I understand why plastics are helpful to certain people, especially when it comes to sterile environments or people who have very specific physical needs due to any kind of disability they have. But at the end of the day, these things not existing at all, not needing to produce this waste is, should be our first solution, but not everybody's on that bus right now. A lot of people are sitting on, on the recycling bus right now, which is going nowhere but we need everybody to be on the reduced bus first as much as possible. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we all need to be on the same page in conservation, <laughs> but first we need to make sure that we get everybody there first. Everybody's got to get on the same page with us and then go forward with our solutions. So if, if I was going to tell somebody starting out or already in wildlife conservation, like what they can do to do better and to do more, it's, it's, you know, it's expanding that audience. It's reaching out to more people and it's, it's trying to make sure that we are not leaving people behind in conservation, which is traditionally what we've always done, unfortunately. Yeah. Leaving no one behind. I think that's a, it's a good place to, to end the show. Thank you so much, Kristen, for, for joining. It's been very insightful. I think, some of the things, some of the ways I even think might have changed, I'll have to listen back and, and see. So uh, do why, don't you, why don't you let everybody know where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure. Um, so I have I have a website that I moderately <laughs> check on called thenaggingnaturalist.com and it basically introduces my podcast and it has all my episodes available with links to, uh, well, it's, it's a little bar where you can listen, but it's basically uh, my anchor links. Um, and I'll put updates on, on there periodically about what's going on with the podcast. I'm also on social media. I am moderately on Facebook and Instagram, but if you want to see where I am the most, it's basically Twitter. If you want to see where I am constantly, it's on Twitter. And my handle is at nag underscore naturalist. And that's ba basically if I'm being quiet anywhere else, you can hop on Twitter and you'll probably see like 30 posts from me because I just, I just like Twitter's format. I find it's a much more engaging format than any other form of social media. Um, but I mean, people can always feel free to reach out to me. I do have an email. It's the naturalist at the nagging naturalist.com. So they can always feel free to reach out to me there or send me uh, private messages on any one of my social media accounts. And I'm usually pretty good about <laughs> responding to people and engaging with them. Um, I love when people ask me questions too. So if people come up to me and ask me questions, um, I really like to engage with that a lot. I don't get enough of them. I really need to do more Q and A's. Get on, get on that uh, that call in live stream. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just need a radio show. Apparently, I'd be yeah. happier. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much, Kristen. It was really fun chatting. Well, thanks for inviting me. It was fun talking. Yeah, cheers. Have a good one. And that, my dear viewers, was Kristen of the Nagging Naturalist podcast. Be sure to check out uh, her podcast, her show. Check out on Twitter if you enjoyed the show. And also do remember to like on YouTube if you like the show. Uh, rate on podcast services like Podchaser or, or Apple Podcast. Um, subscribe if you like so you can get more uh, interesting conversations with interesting people in the science communication and geek culture space. Otherwise, stay tuned and cheers.